Hi everyone, welcome to the fifth FameLab semi-finals in Basel. My name is Martina ribar I am a science journalist, science communicator and a chemist. And you might know me from my social media profiles called scienceexercises.eu, where I focus on science communication and education. So let's introduce FameLab. It is one of the biggest science communications competitions in the world. The best participants will qualify for the national finals, which will take place later this year. And winning this round will give them a ticket for the international FameLab final. In general, participants have three minutes to present any scientific topic which falls into the STEM subjects area. So science, technology, engineering, and maths. Unlike other competitions, they are not allowed to use PowerPoint slides, but if they want to, they can use props. A jury will judge the presentations and decide who will go to the finals in Bern. When we look at the participants this year, it looks really, really interesting. We have 11 people who signed up, five are female and six are male. Some of them are doing this competition for the very first time. Some of them are skilled science communicators already. When we look at the motivation to participate, they would like to fight misinformation, make science understandable to a general public, and engage with people with different backgrounds, which I find really, really inspiring. They also told us what they would like to be instead of becoming a scientist, if they could choose again. They would like to be farmers, philosophers, and even a sushi blogger. I would actually try that, especially if it would be science related. That's all I had to share for the beginning. Let's watch the videos now. If you find yourself bored during the quarantine, you need a new hobby. I can share mine. I like to program. And let me explain why I think programming is a great hobby for you too. So first of all, you already done it. If you ever set a timer on a microwave, you've programmed. You had an input, a lasagna. You set some instructions and then you obtain an output, a lasagna which is half frozen, half lava. Now, Programming, that's all there is. You have um, a defined set of instructions that you communicate to a machine that, to make it do what you have in mind. Now, there are different machines with different languages, but the underlying logic is always the same. You have conditions, you have functions that need to be executed multiple times, and then you have functions that need to be executed only once. So, for example, if I press start on the microwave, that's a condition, if, and then, um, the amount of time that I set on the timer will define how long the function heat up has to run for. And after that, a um, single function will be executed to let me know that the, uh, my food is ready. Now, given a microwave is not the go-to device if you want to build a website, but the rules are the same and the logic still applies and there are no limits to what you can build with that logic. Which, which brings me to my second um, uh, point for what programming is great. I realized it's not the feeling of sitting in front of a screen for like 10 hours per day that I cherish, but it's rather the, the dazzling feeling of cracking a puzzle. Knowing how to program allows me to be completely creative and to build what I have in mind. Now, I know we have a different idea of what creativity looks like, but actually programming is an extremely uh, free form of self-expression. If I'm honest, I think programming is the closest thing we have to magic because you write down a spell, and if you get it right, then um, you can control inanimate objects, which I think is crazy cool. So what I'm trying to say here is you can really build whatever you have in mind. You can build a, mu a new musical instrument, you can control prosthesis, and you can even crack the code and find out how to use the defrost option. Now, lastly, um, Programs are really the uh, intrinsic or, or invisible structure on which we base our modern life on. And we interact with programs from the moment we wake up. If you, snooze, uh, the, if you hit the snooze button, if you scroll through your social channels, if you uh, commute to work, knowing how to program allows you to peek behind the curtain and take a look backstage and can help you better understand the world we live in. So maybe next time you are uh, about to heat up with a microwave the uh, third portion of leftovers, you can um, maybe use the set, same skills to program your next invention.
hey, hey, you, yeah, over here. Hi, whoever's watching this. I know you've had a rough few months, the coronavirus pandemic, having to stay home, and you know, the days start to blend together and you feel like you're not really doing anything. But what if I told you that besides washing your hands and social distancing, there's something else you could do to join us scientists in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic? Well, are you interested? Good. So first to start, we have to know a little bit about our enemy. So the coronavirus, if you look at it under the microscope, looks like it's got a crown of spikes around it. And these are what we call spike proteins. These spike proteins serve a really important purpose because when they come into our bodies and try to infect our cells, it's gonna be the tips of these spike proteins that <laughs> allow them to infect us. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, usually our bodies have a defense mechanism that makes antibodies, which are basically like little agents that go out and they bind to very specific parts of a virus or bacteria. And it gives a signal to our immune system to get it out. Well, while so many antibodies can bind all over a virus, it's a very specific few that bind right here at the tip. And what happens when that binds is, well, it's no longer infectious. It can't enter our cells anymore. And we call these neutralizing antibodies. And these, well, they're the holy grail that we're looking for. So normally how you make these is, well, you get exposed to a virus, you could potentially get sick, and while you're out and about, you could spread it to other people. We can't have that right now. So how else can you do your part? Well, you can help us make a neutralizing antibody. Because remember how I said antibodies detect really specific parts of a virus? Well, right now, we don't know what the tip looks like of this spike protein. So an initiative uh, that we've just started is called Folding at Home. And what we're trying to do is basically take computers from all over the world and build a supercomputer that could run millions of calculations to really predict what that tip looks like. And you can help because we can take computers from CERN, we can take computers from around the world, and you can join in with the computer that you're watching this on right now maybe, or your phone. So what about it? Do you want to join us? Did you ever know that battery market represents 25% of worldwide technology market? Well, it is not strange if you think deeply about it. How many times you have been in touch with battery through your daily life activity? Your phone, your laptop, and even your car. There is no doubt about it. Battery is a backbone of our modern life. But if we go to the dark side of battery, how many times your phone battery hit you down in a very important situation, like emergency? The question then just off to our mind. Why we can't have battery standards for months, years, and even forever? Well, to answer this question carefully, we need to understand how does the battery work, what are the limitations and the challenges for battery. So the battery is a device that can store electric energy in a form of chemical energy and convert it back vice versa by three main components positive electrode, negative electrode, and the electrolyte. This concept is first introduced two centuries ago by Volta, when he invented his first rechargeable battery. And the rechargeable means just can be used one time. From this time till now, scientists are trying to evolve the battery system till we have metal rechargeable battery. And metal here, it means we are using metal in both the electrode and negative electrode. And rechargeable means we can use it many times. Great. Among all of this rechargeable battery, lithium ion battery is the holy grail of this research because it can afford high capacity, it means longer time, with good price and adapt to new technology. Sadly, everything comes with a price. Lithium ion battery has, main three, has three main drawbacks. Firstly, safety concern, it might explode, environmental problem, as it have with toxic chemicals inside it, and the main problem is that lithium metal price is going increasing day by day. Recent study from Tesla, they said like 30% of, of the whole price of Tesla car just come from battery. From this point, scientists try to evolve and improve better research to find another alternative solution to lithium-ion battery. 
among all of this solution, organic rechargeable battery has a great potential as we use the here organic molecules from the nature in the battery, in the both of electron and negative electron. And this is the point that I started my PhD. I was in love in polymers and battery as well. As this system has great advantage, firstly, it's environmental safe, it has no explosion risk, and it can deliver capacity loss to lithium ion battery. Well, if we have this great advantage, why we can implement right away in the industry? The answer is simple, just we have still pricing issue. That's why many scientists around the world, around the world, including me, are doing our best to afford the safe next generation of organic rechargeable battery and give your Tesla car a 30% discount. Thank you. An open wound can be a weak point for a harmful bacteria to get advantage of it and make you sick. And what we do? We use antibiotics. But we're not just using antibiotics, we overuse them, like getting five different of them at the same time, although you could just use one and that will make you healthy again. Or we misuse them, like <clears throat> we get a little bit of cough and you start taking antibiotics, which will not help it at all. But what happens when we use antibiotics like this? Let me explain. Antibiotics are your weapons to fight with the harmful bacteria but you don't have that many weapons. So use the same weapons and you use excessively on your enemy. And then your enemy just gets smarter. Now it knows how to get away with these weapons. And they can also resist high dosages of these weapons. <laughs> it doesn't end here. They go and tell their fighting strategies to their friends. Now they also know how to get away with these weapons. You know, these kind of things never stay as a secret. They spread like wildfire. And this is the point where my research steps in. I'm trying to find a smart way to kill this harmful bacteria. And to do that, I peep at their secret life to find their weak point. And what I see is a tiny Hunger Games situation. So there is a limited amount of food and in every corner, different types of bacteria. And what they all want is to get the food for themselves. But one of them has a really smart plan to eliminate the others and snatch the food for itself. So what it does is, it brings out a poison apple, which is a little treat for the others, and it offers it to them, these delicious traps. And the ones that have weaknesses for it, they fall for the traps and they die. And you know who dies? The bacteria that makes us sick. Our enemy is coming. So I decide to collaborate with the smart bacteria and take a closer look to these poison apples. And I come up with different versions of it. Different color, different smell, different taste of it. And I give it back to smart bacteria, which goes again and offers these delicious traps to our enemy. And then I go and see how they're gonna react to these different poisoned apples until I found the most attractive and the most effective poisoned apple to get adventures of their like weakest point and kill them. So, probably you guys have heard the term, diamonds are a girl's best friend. Well, I want to let you know a little secret. It's actually the defects that are the best part. So, today I want to tell you a little bit about one very special diamond defect called the NV center. And I'm willing to bet that most of you have actually probably seen this thing before. Why? Because that's what gives diamond their color. So, what does the NV center actually look like? Well, if we were to look at diamond really close, we would see we have this really nice regular pattern of carbon atoms. So if we now take one of these carbon atoms out and replace it with a nitrogen and have a hole nearby, what we get is a nitrogen vacancy or NV center. And this little tiny defect is amazing because it acts as a sensor and it can measure a number of things. It can measure magnetic fields, electric fields, temperature, the list goes on. But how? So what we actually have to do is we have to excite this NV. And we do this by shining a green laser at it. We shine a green laser and the NV begins to emit red photons. 
Then when we measure these red photons, we learn all the information we need. And it all relies on the fact that the NV has three states, it has a zero, plus one, and minus one state. And if the NV is in the zero state, it produces a lot of photons. In the plus minus one states, less. So in this way, we can determine what state the NV is in. And then if we measure the energy differences between these states, we can determine what, for example, the magnetic field is at the NV. And that's because the energy levels depend on the magnetic field. And this is exactly what we do in our lab. We measure the tiny magnetic fields produced at the surfaces of materials to learn more about their material properties. But you can go much further than this. Let's say you're a biologist and you want to learn a little bit about how nerve cells send impulses. Well, this impulse is really just a current and currents produce magnetic fields. And so scientists are working on getting the NV close enough to the cell such that you can measure these magnetic fields in real time. You could also say, as I mentioned, measure temperature. And let's say you're trying to determine a way of heating cancer cells locally. Well, the NV center acts as a great thermometer. So with that, I hope I can convince you that even though diamonds might be a girl's best friend, when that girl is a scientist, it's the defects that are the best. Hello, my name is Alessandro and I'm a trained rocket scientist. What I would like to do for the next three minutes is to bring you on a very short journey to try to understand together if rocket science is as complicated as you might think or a little bit easier. Rocket science is a very multidisciplinary topic, but it involves basically three main aspects. One is the structures, so all the physical components of our rocket, like the metal or the ceramics, that keep the thing basically together. The second is all the systems, which includes the pipes, the valves, the electronics that make the system function properly and the people who know about it. And the third one, the dearest one to me, is the rocket engine itself, or the propulsion system, which consists in the motor and in the fuel and in the oxygen that we bring with us. Let me give you an example. Your car, your car engine, works by burning together a fuel, petrol, and air taken from the environment. Unfortunately, in space we have no air, so we have also to bring it with us. And for our rocket, unfortunately, not any fuel would work because we need an immense amount of energy to need to reach the thrust and the velocity needed to escape the Earth gravity pool. So what we do as rocket scientists is to find the combination of fuel and oxidizer, as we call the air that we bring with us, to achieve this immense speed, which is 11 kilometer per second. To bring together air, oxidizer, and our fuel makes our rocket basically a cylindrically shaped bomb that would drive, would blow up fast into a very high temperature. Consider that fuel burning temperature is up to a couple thousand degrees Celsius. So us as rocket scientists, what we try to do and what we do is to find a combination of ingredients for our fuel and for our oxidizer to make it strong enough and safe enough to reach into space. In, over the years, many, many different ingredients have been tested, and that's my, my very own special skill, is to identify such ingredients like rubber, which is not very different from what you use for your pencil eraser, paraffin wax, which is very similar to candle or beeswax. Some fancier or weirder stuff has been used, like the rubbish from the astronauts. But to really reach the energy we need, we also add special ingredients like very, very thin, very, very small metal particles, like a thousandth of a human hair in width. What can we say? Uh, that rocket science might be really complicated, but I hope you can say now, it's not really rocket science and mean it. All right, so everyone, hold on to your chairs, take out your pens and papers, because in the next three minutes, I'm going to show you exactly how you can build a star on Earth. So let's start with the basics. 
Stars have one very basic physical principle happening inside them, nuclear fusion. It is this very process with which tiny hydrogen atoms fuse together to form heavier atoms. Yeah? And when this happens, they release a tremendous amount of energy. It is this very energy that is given by the E in E equals mc square. So there you go, step number one, get hydrogen atoms to fuse together. Now, while fusion of these atoms might sound like a very simple process, it is actually far from simple. These atoms hate each other. They hate each other so much that no matter how much you try to push them together, they will never fuse. So we use one tiny hack. We can increase the temperature to a level that these atoms come start coming close together enough for them to fuse. And that brings us to step number two. And this is a difficult one. Raise the temperature by a hundred million degrees Celsius. Yes, that's a difficult one. Most people fail at this one. But if you have still somehow managed to get this done, we can move on to our next step. Step number three. Once your fusion reaction has started, it is, it is going to rapidly expand outwards. You would want to control this outward expansion by an equal compression force. Uh, so that your fusion reaction doesn't go out of hand, yeah? On stars, this compression is achieved by the force of gravitation. This is what keeps the stars stable. On Earth, you will have to rely on, among others, a strong magnetic force to counter the uh, expansion of fusion. So that brings us to step number three. Get very strong magnets to compress or confine your fusion reaction. Now we are almost there, yeah? Uh, all the basic ingredients are ready. All we need is a vessel to put all these together. And decades of research have shown that one of the best vessels to conduct a fusion reaction in is literally shaped like a donut. Literally, a donut enlarged to the size of this room is what an ideal fusion reactor would look like. So there you go, step number four build a fusion reactor to execute steps one, two, and three. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen, you have built yourself a working fusion reaction, AKA a star on Earth. Thank you. We all have that one friend that was beaten by a dog during childhood and it got so traumatized that every time he sees a very cute dog approaching or even hear it's barking, he immediately enters into fear mode. Sometimes he stops moving and sometimes he starts running away as far as he can. So I love dogs and I really don't understand. What is happening inside their brain? In which brain regions? And which cells are being stimulated during fear? The brain has been one of the most mysterious organs and is the most difficult to access. On the other hand, fear is a complex emotion related to the exaggeration of our sensations. We all experience some kind of fear, like my friend when he sees a dog. Me, for example, I am terrified of frogs. Whenever I see one, I start sweating, my heart starts beating fast and I immediately freeze. But I know this is just my brain tricking me, because I'm pretty sure that some of you might think that frogs are kind of cute. But we could also talk about traumatic situations, like veterans that come back from a war, and every time they hear a loud sound like a truck passing by, they transport themselves back to a life-threatening uh, situation that they experience, like a bomb exploding. And although at different levels, these are all situations in which we tend to recreate our own reality based on what we see, hear, or any, any other kind of senses. In my lab, we are using mice to study fear. So we put them in a fearful situation for a bit and they, they freeze. They really stop moving, just like us. And we can see what is happening inside their brains live using a very tiny and very light microscope. And so they are moving around, doing whatever they want, and we can analyze and link the activity of, their, of the neurons with their behavior. So this technique can bring our understanding of emotions to an even higher level. And so it can be used to understand and develop drugs for traumatic situations. 
Just imagine what it could be to understand how we can trick the brain of my friend to not panic every time a cute dog comes his way. Or maybe mine when I see a frog. But, and most importantly, this can be a huge step to find the cure for serious traumatic situations and for diseases where our reality is distorted, like autism or schizophrenia, or really any disease of the brain. And it will finally help us understand one of the biggest mysteries of this century, the one we all carry right here. Thank you very much. Why is nature so diverse? If evolution by natural selection is about survival of the fittest, why, after billions of years, do we still see differences within the same species? Also, why do we have sex? If I could just clone myself, I could spread my genes much faster because all of my offspring could have more offspring. With sex, basically half of my offspring will just be sperm delivery devices. So, why so much diversity and why so much sex? Well, there's a theory called the Red Queen Hypothesis, which claims the answer to both of these questions is parasites. Now, you may already know the Red Queen from the Alice in Wonderland books. At one point, the Red Queen tells Alice, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. But what does this have to do with parasites? Well, the Red Queen theory predicts that when hosts and parasites fight, they follow one main rule, being common is bad. Okay, so imagine I'm a parasite and my hosts are M&Ms, but I can only infect yellow M&Ms. Now imagine my host population looks like this. There's yellow and blue, but yellow is more common. Well, this is great. I can grow big and strong and make more parasites like myself. It's a bad day to be a yellow M&M. But now, as the yellows get taken out by me and my parasite posse, the blues will start to rise, and soon the population will look more like this. Lots of blue, not much yellow. Now, what if there's another parasite that can only infect blue M&Ms? Mr. Blue will make his own crew, and, he'll, and, the, and they'll spread throughout the population, but only until they start bringing their host numbers down, and then the yellows can rise again, and then the cycle continues, back and forth, Parasites and hosts rising and falling indefinitely. It takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place, says the Red Queen. Now, in this race of coevolution, there are no winners. Yellow is no better or worse than blue. They're just different. And this is how the population can stay diverse. Because being common is bad, it's hard for any one type of host or parasite to take over completely. Now, as for sex, imagine that a yellow and a blue M&M get together and make a green M&M. First of all, it's not common, so that's good, and it's new. This M&M and all of its babies will live parasite-free for now. So, even though parasites are not our friends, the Red Queen tells us that we can still thank parasites for helping to keep the world such a wonderfully diverse place and for encouraging us to have sex. Under challenging environments, plants struggle, but they are not alone. Uh, and in my research, we look at the things that come to rescue uh, and help them grow and achieve their full potential. And to do so, we look below, below ground for the things that you cannot see with your bare eyes. Uh, the unsung hero of my story is called Mycorrhizae. Myco stands for fungus and rhizo stands for roots. So it's the fungi of the roots. And what the mycorrhiza does primarily is, is in this symbiosis and this partnership between organisms, uh, it massively increases the volume of soil that plant roots have access to. So let me break that down for you. The soil is a highly heterogeneous environment where you have the resources that plants need all scattered around. And, and some places are very difficult to reach for the roots because they are physically uh, embedded. But the mycorrhiza, which is ma basically massive networks of super tiny hyphae or fungal filaments, they can reach out to those spots and then transfer the nutrients to the plant roots. So the, these filaments interact with the plant roots and deliver the nutrients that they need. In exchange for that, the plant uh, delivers carbon and other photosynthetic products to the fungi. So what it gets spicy is that uh, this fungi can colonize multiple plant species at the same time 
uh, building something called, uh, something called a common mycorrhizae network. Um, and in these networks, plants can transfer, can, 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 uh, transfer both nutrients and uh, also information about the environment. Now then, to give you a very precise example of what I do, sometimes plants uh, that have shallow root systems uh, struggle under drought. Uh, but there are other plant species that have very deep roots that can access water that's in, in, in the bottom ground. Uh, and then when you have a common mycorrhizae network that are, are interconnecting both plant species, you can actually transfer water from one plant to another, and thereby improving the water relations and continue growth, even under challenging circumstances. So using that knowledge, we can actually develop sustainable agroecosystems where we take advantage of already available resources that are just below our feet. Uh, so next time you struggle, uh, don't forget to look below your feet and also around you because you're also not alone. Once upon a time, when you took a walk or a horse ride out in the countryside, and you would see a grassland, you'd see many different colors, from green to yellow, pink, other types of green and blue. It was just beautiful. These different types of colors, they represent also a high number of different plant species that grow there. Together with these plant species, you also have many insects, butterflies, grasshoppers, wild bees, and that's what I consider a grassland with a high biodiversity. Well, today when I took the train to come here, I was looking out of the window and I also saw grasslands. They were mainly green with some sprinkles of yellow. Pretty boring, not many plant species. So why should we care about having colorful grasslands? Well, as you can imagine, it's not only a matter of beauty, uh, grasslands with a high biodiversity, they deliver important services to us. For example, wild bees that live there, they pollinate our fruit plantations, and like this we have fruits and cherries to eat. Also, they filter our drinking water, and grasslands are important storage for CO2. <coughs> Climate! So, how do we get from these boring green and yellow grasslands to the beautiful colorful ones? Well, this is my job. It's called grassland restoration. And in my project, we are testing different methods on how to improve these grasslands. So I will explain you one method that we use. So it's called the hay transfer method. First of all, you have to find an old uh, species rich grassland, which has many different plants. It's very colorful. And it's pretty difficult to find these grasslands, these colorful ones because there's not many left of them anymore. Once you have found one, it's pretty easy afterwards. You just go there, you cut all the grass and the flowers, you take everything and you put it on a boring green and yellow grassland, one of these green and yellow ones. Then you just sit down and wait and after one or two years, you will have a beautiful grassland with many different colors. So the final aim of our project, as you can imagine, is world domination. But until we get there, we'll provide farmers and local authorities with guidelines on how to make grasslands great again. Thank you. And that was our last speaker. Thanks everyone for your time and contributions. They were all amazing, fun and interesting and I would like to rewatch them again. The presentations will be now judged by a jury. They consider three main criteria, which is clarity, content and charisma. I would like to introduce you to our jury members now. First of all, we have Thorsten Schwede, who is the Vice President for Research at the University of Basel. As a professor for bioinformatics at the Biozentrum and the SIB Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, he's working on computational methods to model protein structures from their amino acid sequences. Secondly, we have Michaela Kneisel, who is global head of Musculoskeletal Disease Area, MSD, at the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. She's also chair of the FMI Board of Trustees. Third, 
We have Mirko Winkle, who is assistant professor at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute and an instructor in the transferable skill course video abstract. Lastly, we have Iris Mikain, who is communications officer at the University of Basel and managing editor of the research blog at the University of Basel in English, which is called Sci5. Thorsten, Mirko and Iris discuss the performances of the Basel semi-final in a Zoom meeting and then they decided on the four winners in agreement with the evaluation of Michaela. Now let's have a look at the jury discussion and hear what the jury thought about the participants. Who wants to start? Her stage present was really convincing. I liked how they started off the talk. They, they really connected to the virtual audience. He educated about a current problem. I, I really had the impression that she, she very much mastered her talk. She was very focused. There was one, one talk which really puzzled me. It didn't quite work for me. For me, it was a bit too exaggerated. Yeah, speed was rather high, but I could uh, very easily follow. I didn't know why. What is the motivation? What is the interest? And what is this, uh, what's the purpose? From the story side, uh, for me, she, she was really brilliant. She picked a topic that's highly pertinent and um, relevant to society. That, that he found the right balance of giving detail, but then shying away when it gets too technical. She triggered a process where you start to think, hmm, maybe there's something that I could do. It was extremely engaging and, and also charismatic. Because the analogy is fine, but the link back into the science wasn't clear to me. As a non-expert, I had some difficulty understanding. He's building up a very nice story. He's building up the pressure or everybody's waiting for now, now comes the story. Now comes what can I do? And then comes the cold shower. Maybe the story was not always as crystal clear, uh, but she did great uh, in how she delivered. Parameters of content, clarity and charisma came together in a almost perfect synthesis. It's something that I would love to know more about. So it was very coherent in terms of her performance and therefore a great talk. She was a bit nervous, but if you forget about the nervous factor, to me this was really an outstanding presentation. In terms of both, you know, content, clarity, but also charisma, she was, for me personally, the strongest. On behalf of the jury, I'd like to announce the winner of the semi-final in Basel. The jury very much agreed that four out of the 11 presentations were noteworthy. That said, there can be only one winner, and in the end it was a close call between two female scientists. So the winner of this year's semi-final is Céline Manioko. She convinced the jury through her engaging stage presence, her imaginative storytelling skills, her clarity of content, and through her chosen topic, which is highly relevant to our day-to-day -day lives. Second, and cl following closely behind Celine, is Maridel Fredriksen. In addition, the jury would like to nominate two more candidates, namely Kunal Soni and Baichingao. Well done, congratulations to all of you, especially to Celine, and best of luck for the finals. All four will have the opportunity to participate in a communications training and to join the Swiss finals of FameLab. Congratulations to all the winners and good luck at the finals. Represent Basel, okay? This was the fifth FameLab semi-final. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. We had loads of fun creating this. And please don't forget to like and share this video. Bye.